Steve, can you guys hear me? Okay. I always get nervous and then we start talking and I'm fine. So if I do weird stuff at first, just ignore it. Zipper's good, we good. All right, so I told Sam I didn't do any slides because they're boring, but really I just didn't do any slides. So <laughs> I wanna talk to you guys about what you wanna talk about and I hate when someone just talks at you and you're like, that's not what I wanted to hear today or that's not helpful or whatever it is. And so, I have a lot of things brewing and I have a lot of ideas that I wanna share with you, but I just also wanna understand like what, what do you guys wanna know? Yes. How do you predict a successful marketing campaign before it started? Uh, so we have this magic eight ball. I'm not joking. No, I am joking. No, I don't. I, what, what you wanna do is a couple things is number one is like, is that resonate with our core audience? If it resonates, cool. Um, we also look at it from an impression count. So we actually, we're like, how much sales do we want to make for this one launch or this product or whatever it is? We just launched Chelsea Boots yesterday. It's a new form of our soft soul. And we knew in order to make our goal, we needed to have 14,000 visitors to the website. So then we divide that across our channels, knowing what each channel will bring, including influencers, and then build a marketing campaign around the impressions and our brand. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes. So it seems to me like the baby clothing <coughs> and baby shoes market was highly saturated when you started your company. Uh-huh. What set your product apart that you're able to grow so fast on something that hasn't been around for a really long time? So that's the thing is there's like no innovation because there wasn't, it was like clothes that my mom had put me in and innovated around maybe color and a little bit of fabric, but no innovation around style. And so I um, hated the boy options when I had a son and they're still not really good. I don't know if anyone has a baby boy, but there's still not really any cool boy options. It's either super feminine or really masculine and there's no like, hey, I just have a cool son and I don't want him to wear bears and baseballs and guns all the time. So um, I created the shoe with that in mind as like a classic leather shoe that would last, would, that would kind of have a legacy was like the idea. What are you working on that is highly saturated that you need to innovate on? I'm not, but I feel like that, that was a really saturated market. So it's actually not. Up. Like, why do you think it's saturated? Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I have been looking at having a baby, but when I look at like all the stuff out there that we're supposed to buy, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like the baby market in general is just saturated with a lot of just product that people don't need in general. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that they do need, there's just a lot of it out there, and it costs a lot of money. Yeah. From a consumer point of view, yeah. it just surprises me that you had 6,000% growth, revenue growth, right. years, yeah. something as simple as a baby shoe. Right, but yeah. that's the genius behind it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Innovation on right. style. Right. Thank you. I mean. <laughs> um, any other questions or things you want to talk about? Yes. Can you talk about your channels? You mentioned that you have a number of channels. Why are they your channels? Why are they there? So we, the way we talk about channels is um, marketing channels. We actually only have, we have wholesale, well, sorry, we have our e-commerce site, and then every other thing we do, including wholesale, is considered a marketing channel. So, um, email, Instagram, influencers, Facebook, and um, each, each of those channels requires like a little bit of a different tone, a little bit of a different message, and we're constantly like testing and iterating on each channel. Facebook, paid Absolutely. advertising, yes, yes. We, we, you pass this threshold, and I don't know what it is, I can guess. I think for Instagram right now, it's 20,000 followers. I think for Facebook, it's around 50 to 60,000 followers. And once you pass that threshold, you no longer, you're in the pay to play model. Yes. So that surprises me because I would, would have thought that Etsy and Pinterest would be on my no, well, we don't, we, yeah, we don't sell on Etsy anymore. We haven't sold on Etsy for five years. And um, Pinterest is kind of just, 
As soon as, do you, have you guys notice how you can like pin stuff on Instagram? As soon as they turn that on to where it can be live, where people can see what you've pinned, um, Pinterest is gonna go away. I think, in my opinion. Because then you have everything you need in one channel. And you don't need to go to Pinterest. Yeah, all your fitness people in one channel, right? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they give us a little bit of a notification. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> yes. What's your plan for growth now? Um, so our company will succeed in the ability, well, in the way we succeed in entering new categories. This summer we launched a Kickstarter for a new product category, our diaper bag. And um, we hit 500K in sales. And so we consider that a success, but now we have to follow up with like, continued growth in that category. So next year we're launching four new diaper bag styles. Um, we also launched sandals this year. And then we have um, a couple things I can't talk about for growth for next year. But that's where we'll succeed, is in new categories. Mm-hmm, yeah, babies, yeah. Is it still Mm-hmm, yeah. Yes? So what led you Yeah. And had a good idea and went with it. Was there certain experiences that led to you deciding to develop that idea when you did do it? Yeah, so I didn't go to college. But what I did do is when I was younger, I would steal my sibling's stuff and then make them pay me to get it back. <laughs> and then I would also um, hustle like you wouldn't believe. You know when you like go to the fair and there's like the lady selling glow sticks, but she's not actually part of the fair. I was a glow stick lady for a while. Um, I've like always just sold stuff and made stuff and always hustling, queen of side projects. So I feel like I've always been an entrepreneur, but uh, no one, like I didn't know that that was like a real thing you could do. Um, so when my daughter was born actually, uh, my husband was in school and we we're very poor. I don't know if any of you guys can relate to that, like really poor. and. Um, I remember I was like taking coins to Coinstar so I could buy feminine hygiene products and I felt like, you know what, there's going to be a time in my life where I will consider this like, this will, this will be meaningful and it's still not meaningful so I'm still waiting for that. But um, I remember sitting outside Target thinking, I just want to make enough money to be able to like go into Target and buy whatever I want. Like that was totally my goal. And um, I had a friend, and she said, I'm going to make stuff and sell it online. And I looked at her, and I was like, yeah, she's not smarter than me, so I'm going to do that too. So I started making stuff and selling it online. I was a very early adopter of Etsy, probably like within number two to 300, like that early. And I watched my friends who started on Etsy, and they would make a product. And all of a sudden, that product and their shop would kind of take off. And I told my husband, if I could find that one product, I know that my shop could take off. And when my son was born two years later and I started making the moccasins, that's when things just kind of took off for me. Yeah. Yes. So, talk a little bit about your supply chain as a startup. Like, how did you get people to make this product? How did you make this, like, financially possible on yeah. a small scale? And then how did you scale that out? So, everything good in my business, I've fallen... I say ass backwards usually, but ba backwards because I'm by the sacrament table, so I won't <laughs> swear. But um, I've fallen backwards into it. So here's what happened. I was making moccasins all by myself. And it was terrible. Does anyone sew? You sew. Do you like it? Yeah. Right. Times that by 100 and then take care of two kids during the day. You hate it at the end of the day. So I was making them myself. I was cutting them myself. I was doing everything. And I thought, oh, things have got to change. What can I do? So I hired this girl locally, and she started sewing them and making them. And it was working. We were doing like this made-to-order kind of thing. And then um, I was like, OK, we're going to, we need to move to a factory. So we found a factory in LA. Um, and we had put in our first order. And it, it's a lot of money, because you've got to pay for everything up front. And at the same time, I had 30,000 followers on Instagram. So I was like feeling like legit. And um, I was like, let's do a sell. We've never done a sell. So we put the whole shop 25% off. 
and within like a couple hours had sold 30 or 3,000 pairs of moccasins that were not made, didn't have the leather for, no one to make them, and we had one order of 200 moccasins coming from my factory. And I was like, what? I don't know what I'm gonna do. So what was awesome about that though is we had this huge influx of cash, so I was able to quickly turn it around and get product made. Um, it's kind of like the Kickstart model now, where you just like make the money and then pay for the product. But at the time, Kickstarter wasn't doing it. So um, that was kind of the catalyst for getting the manufacturer. Uh, this year, we actually bought that manufacturer. So now we own them. We're moving them to Utah, and um, we're going we're gonna to have, we're going to double it here. Yeah. Any other questions? Are we talking about cool stuff or is this boring? Is it cool? Okay. Yes. Do you have any pictures or samples of your stuff? Freshlypicked.com. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teaching you to fish right here. <laughs> um, yes. I read that you grew your company by 6,000%. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, okay, so when you go from, it's just one to five to 10 million, that's it. Does that mean you don't know? No, I mean, I know, here's the thing. Um, that was a good question. I do know, I grew my company through social media and grew my company through product offering and it just kind of hit at the right time. Like, honestly, I'm super lucky. And I know that's not a cool answer and it's kind of crap. Uh, my friend Clark says that all the time, he's super lucky. But I just really happened to be on the internet at the right time with a store that people paid a lot of attention to. Shark Tank was super helpful and that kind of happened at the right time for me. And so the growth was exponential over that. But I worked hard, you know? That sucked too, right? That wasn't helpful. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I do know. I know how I grow my company. Go, yes. How did you get on Shark Tank? Um, so, the producers reached out to me and then three weeks, three weeks later I filmed. So, so just because they saw that you were an entrepreneur that was doing well, they found you? No, like someone had said, hey, pay attention to this girl. Like you should put her on the show kind of thing. Um, Is but, there anything you can actively do to reach out to that? Do you want do you want an intro? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering, like, because um, it, it uh, I mean, obviously that was a big boost for you, and so do you have to like know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody on the show? Is that no, right? like I know friends who've like just applied through the channels and gotten on, and then I've also introduced a bunch of people, and you know, I think now in their tenth or eleventh season, it they're casting a little bit different than when I went on. You know, like they gotta be casting interesting, different stuff. So, I don't know. I actually stopped watching the show after I was on because I get post-traumatic stress disorder from it. <laughs> so, I don't watch it very much anymore. Okay, yes. How is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, it's hard, right? Um, my husband is now a stay at home dad, and my kids uh, are 11 and 8, and so they're older. Um, they watched a lot of TV at first, lots of TV. They turned out fine. So if your kids watch a lot of TV, don't worry about it. They can still turn out fine. Um, uh, but, you know, what, what, what Christian and I have done is we have structured our whole lives around the safety and security of our children. So, like, my parents live with us. We have a full-time nanny. We have, like, a bunch of things set up where the kids feel safe and they feel secure and they feel loved. Um, but it's definitely a challenge, you know. Yes. He was a cabinet maker. And now he's a stay-at-home dad slash drone racer. I actually call him a drone liberty. He was on ESPN this summer. Did anyone see that? The drone racing on ESPN? My husband took seventh. Yeah. 
So if anyone wants to follow him on Instagram, it's FPV Provo. <laughs> he likes it when you go on and like make fun of him or whatever. No, he doesn't, but he's awesome. Yes. Yeah, why did your deal with Damon on the Shark Tank fall apart? <laughs> So Damon changed the deal post-show. So he was like, hey, I'll give you this much money for this percentage of your company. And then it was like, this much money and you have to pay me back and I get to keep this much of your company and you also have to pay me interest on it and it just like wasn't a good deal anymore. Um, and I actually just brought on funding this year um, in June. So I have brought on a partner. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Steve. So could you talk about bootstrapping versus fundraising? And why would you do one versus the other? I don't think I'd bootstrap again. Is that not that's not a good answer though, is it? <laughs> um, it's hard. You don't sleep very well at night. It got to the point where I felt like I was holding a glass castle in an earthquake and like I had two personal guarantees against my house where my children slept. Um, I was leveraged to my eyeballs through the business. Um, I just felt like, man, if I drop one thing, this whole thing's gonna come crashing down around me. And it really made it so I, I wasn't a creative, it got to the point this time last year where I didn't feel like a creative entrepreneur, I didn't feel like it was innovative. It felt like I was not fun to be around for my team. Um, my COO actually called it the emotional roller coaster that we all ride, so I don't feel like that's a good description of your boss. Um, and when we brought on funding this year, it's been incredible for me. I feel like, wow, I can totally be creative again, and I can think of fun ideas, and I can think of really cool ways to build a community and talk to our customers and new product. And um, I just felt too leveraged. So I think bootstrapping's awesome. Uh, and I think do that as long as you can, but if you have someone who's smart and has been there before and wants to invest in your company, I would say go for it. Um, and like run them by, like run them through references because not, every, not all investors are created equal. I really lucked out with my investors. They're honestly like, uh, I hear about this like phase where like the honeymoon period's over and now like ugh, it's scary. Like these guys just keep getting better and better. So I feel lucky. Yes. Okay. Yes. I saw a hand. Yes. Probably not do a product company, probably set it up as like a reoccurring revenue model. Like, I think like, I mean, we did, the, the sales we did, the amount of sales we did, it just took a lot of capital to like run that business. You just reach this inflection point where in order to continue growing, you have to have a lot of capital, like a lot of cash on hand. And so, I don't know, I don't think so, maybe. I think neck, I think also inexperienced, quite honestly, like I'm inexperienced. I get asked all the time, like, what is your biggest challenge you face? And it's like, me, I am my biggest challenge that I face. And at every stage of the business, it's like a different big challenge. Right now, my biggest fear in life is that I become irrelevant to the business. And at the exact same time, my biggest fear in life is that in order for anything to do to be done right, I have to do it. And it's like these two competing things that are essentially the same thing but on different sides of the coin. And um, like I'm having to walk kind of this balance of like, oh shoot, like I see you guys run into the ledge. How far is the drop and do I let you drop and what are the stakes? And then like it's just like this balance of like me becoming a better leader. Um, and I don't always make the right decision and I don't always do what's right. I mean, I just signed like a $5 million contract on accident without running it by the lawyer. So whatever, you know, you just move on. <laughs> but it's not awesome for my team who has to go talk to the attorneys about it, you know. Um, should have, like, that's my own ledge. I should have. So, uh, I don't know, did that answer your question? Yeah? Okay, yes.
No. I mean, I, okay, let me back up. I used to be, right? My first copycat was like some girl over here in Provo that was like selling my moccasins at $10 and I was like, ooh, and I was like on the phone with lawyers and I was crying and I was like, I got her number off some random shady website and her address and I'm like, I'm gonna go to her house with my kids. I'm gonna say, you're stealing from these mouths. And then I was like, probably that's not a good idea. Again, my biggest challenge is me. Um, so I, uh, I actually, that, it was hard. Like I haven't always had this like really cool attitude about it. But what I realized was this. If someone's looking at what you're doing and decides, I want to spend my limited amount of time that I'm not spending with my family, um, working out, going to church, Instagram, YouTube, like all these other things you could be putting your time and energy towards. If someone's looking at what you're doing and says, that's what I want to do too, uh, it, is, it is really a compliment. And sometimes it doesn't always feel like a compliment, um, but it is. Uh, what freshly the advantage I have is the first mover advantage and so I have established a brand and a community and I'm in the major retailers and so copycats can come and copycats can go but no one's gonna take my place you know yes I know a guy that used to work at Freshly yeah what's his name tell me Lorenzo I love Lorenzo a guy. does he still wear the <laughs> penguin sweatshirt Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> yeah. Um, he talked a lot about um, it was a really good place to work and a really positive company culture. So how have you focused on that? Has that been a specific part of your uh, founding of the company? Oh, such a good question. And it's such a struggle for me, honestly. Like, I'm still, like, constantly checking. Is this a fun place to work? Do people like it? Do they feel supported? Um, I think, like, it goes... It starts with like how we hire people and what values we look for, which is like we look for people who are hungry, we look for people who are humble, and we look for scrappiness. And those are like the three things that we hire for, and those actually like um, really come from inside me. They embody like the way that I approach business. Um, and so we feel like if we can hire for those three values, also there's like permission to play values, like you just can't lie. If you're a liar, there's no place for you at Freshly Picked. Also, cockiness really doesn't have a place. Um, so we, we hire for those three values. Um, we also do a really interesting hiring process, which is everyone who's gonna work with you interviews you. And then we kind of have this powwow and everyone kind of gets to say like their thoughts and their feelings about that person. Um, and we've actually like, we interviewed this person who was gonna be um, on the executive team, and she was like, awesome to me and the other executives, and then anyone under the executive level that interviewed with her, well, they were like, whoa, she's crazy. And we're like, we didn't see it. So it's, it's like helped us a lot, because we were ready to pull the trigger on her, and if we weren't using that interview process, it would have been like months, of, months until you figure that out, and then months of like pulling the scar tissue out of people, and so, how we've arrived there is honestly trial and error. And it's been a lot more error than success. And it's hard. Like, you hire people and you, ho you hope they work out. And then I always feel bad when I fire someone because I feel like I let someone down. Like, I feel like they had this hope and they had this idea they were going to come work at Freshly Picked and it was part of their life plan. And then it didn't work out. So. I actually, I take it personal when I have to fire someone and I've never been, like I still get sweaty and I still spend all night like, ah, and sometimes I have to take a Xanax before because I'm like hyperventilating in the bathroom. Um, so it's been a lot, it's been a hard, long road, but that like, for Lorenzo to say that, he was there for a short time, I feel like it means that we're on the right track. I think we're not exactly where we need to be we still have like things we need to work out, but I think it's just like approaching it with a sense of humility and then also like being really willing to like self like check yourself, make sure you're doing the right thing. Yes. How did you build your website and how do you like that? So we just use Shopify and we use the theme and a designer and super easy. Like someone did it over the weekend. 
Um, we now hired this uh, really awesome firm out of LA and they do like huge websites. And um, we do a lot of advertising. Our social media drives a lot of traffic. Um, we use influencers and they drive a lot of traffic. Um, so it's mostly self-driven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so on Etsy, you had to like pick a name and then if it was taken, like I, so what happened was like two in the morning and put my baby down and I was like, oh, I know what I'm going to name it. And I got on it, it was taken. So like an hour later, I'm still trying all these iterations around this name and finally freshly picked wasn't taken. And then I went to bed and I woke up and I was like, oh, that kind of sucks. That's not a good name. And then I just let it ride for too long and then I couldn't change it. And so that's how I came up with the name Freshly Picked. Um, <laughs> which I suggest. You know why? Because it kind of means nothing. And it means what we want it to mean, you know? Um, if I had to rename it, I'd probably keep it. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, What's up, girl? So you <laughs> Um, I have a friend, Allison. Does anyone follow the Allison show in here? Yeah, girl. <laughs> She's awesome. So Allison always says to me, how did you know how to do that? And my answer for everything is Jesus taught me. And I'm not joking. <laughs> so the Book of Mormon is the best. If you guys get nothing from me, get this. The Book of Mormon is the best business book that you can ever read. Ever. And... I, like, I was going through this huge lawsuit at the same time I'm reading, like, the war chapters in Alma, and it's like, dang, this council of war is a good idea, so I'm calling my own council of war, and I'm, like, looking to these awesome people who, like, figured it out, and I'm building fortresses, and I'm fortifying my fortresses, and I'm doing all these things, and the Book of Mormon, if you allow the Book of Mormon to teach you, it is so relevant for anything you're doing in your day right now. And I read business books and they fall flat and they're boring and also they're not true. They're not true. Most business books are made up or they're edited and it didn't really happen like that. And the Book of Mormon is true. And it's a real thing that happened to real people and those people went through those experiences so that all of us could live in this time and get through it in a wonderful way. So that's how I learned. Jesus taught me. Any other questions? And I'm so happy I can share that because like, it's hard to share that like when you're going to like New York and we're like speaking at this woman's function, they're like, what? <laughs> I mean, you share it in a roundabout way, but I'm lo I love that I can share it with you all. Yes? Since we're already on this topic. Yes. It is so personal, right? And it's so different for every person. Um, I'm going to share with you guys something that I rarely share, but my patriarchal blessing says that I will provide or supplement the income for my family. And I take that as a direct call for me to be the provider in my home. Um, and balance doesn't exist between two things that you're working on. Does that make sense? Balance exists in your emotions. And so for me, I need to understand if what I'm trying to accomplish is actually better for my family and better for the business, or is it better for my pride? And like, if it's better for my pride, then I need to just let it go. But if it's better for my family, or if it's better for the business, then I'll do it. Um, also, like, I don't, like, I work till seven every night, and that's not gonna change anytime soon in the next couple of years, and I'm go I was gone at 7.30 this morning. Um, but what I try to do is that I, again, like, I've set up my whole life 
for the support and safety of my children. And my goal is that when my daughter goes into high school, I'm not working. That's my goal. Because you guys know when most teenage pregnancies happen? Like 85% of them? 3 to 5 p.m. Yeah. Think about it. Yeah, so I'm gonna be home from 3 to 5 p.m. every damn day. You better believe that. <laughs> We're gonna take doors off rooms. Yes? Did you name diaper bags? Yes. So, yes and yes and no and no and yes. So yeah, with all of our new products, we're always trying to acquire new customers because the awesome thing about the baby industry is that it's a self-replenishing market. There's always new babies being born. But the worst thing about a baby industry is that babies grow up and they go, they're like out, they're, they no longer need your product. So we're always trying to acquire new customers and that's kind of like everything that we put out into the world needs to have at least 50% new customer acquisition within like the first couple of days. Otherwise, we don't really consider it like a super big success. Um, so yeah, we're trying to acquire new customers. That's actually why we did it on Kickstarter. My friend Davis Smith, has Davis come and spoke? Not this we're not here, not in this class. Not in this class, he does Cotopaxi, he's awesome. And they kickstart all their new product and they do that to acquire new customers. And I actually sat down with him and his team and talked to him about it. And that's why we decided to do Kickstarter. And it was like, mm, I, I think we we're like 45% new customers, so it was like, successful enough um, and we're gonna continue to like iterate around the feedback that we've gotten from customers. But um, I never look at a product and say, ooh, let's still market share from another company. Like that's not how I look at it. I think what can we do that is innovative that will actually make people's lives better? And let's do that. You know, I, I never, I haven't in the past five years made any business decision on what other people are doing in their business. I just don't like to work from that place. I feel like it's working from a place of fear and I prefer to work from a place of love, which is like, how can I grow this? What will this do for our bottom line? How can I, how, how will this make freshly picked and then everyone's lives that work here better? Yeah. Quiet, yes. The FP, mm -mm, no, no. They're doing their thing, I'm doing mine, we good. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Where are we at? We still have like 10 minutes, yes. How did you initially, like when you were first starting, pick people to bring on to your team? Okay, so first it's like, you like look at the people around you who are, s okay, let me back up. Entrepreneurs, I went through this journey and I actually don't know if other people will admit to this, but I'm sure everyone does. You don't want anyone around you to be smarter than you. You want to be the smartest person in the room and it's actually a terrible idea and it's a terrible way to run a business. And if you guys can leapfrog over that hurdle and over that step, you'll actually be a lot further along. Um, also, entrepreneurs constantly, constantly suffer from this thing called imposter syndrome where you feel like, I definitely don't know what I'm doing. Either they didn't teach me this in school or I didn't learn this in school or Jesus hasn't taught me this yet. And any day someone's gonna show up and they're gonna be from the entrepreneurial police and they're gonna say, nope, you're done, you gotta clear out, you're not doing this right. So it's a real thing, everyone I know. Do you guys know Jeremy Andrus? Jeremy suffers from imposter syndrome and he is like the best entrepreneur in Utah, hands down. Um, and the only way to cure imposter syndrome is to hire people that are smarter than you. And what it does is it allows, like all these people that are smarter than me are constantly looking to me to say like, what are we gonna do? What's the next step? Where are you gonna lead us? And it in turn makes you feel so legit. Um, and then they teach you new words and I learned how to model and someone showed me how to pivot table but I don't really care because that's boring. Um, but you learn how to run your business better from people who are smarter than you. So, at first, so with all that context, at first it was like, I'd look around and I'd be like, okay, does anyone know anyone who they think would be good at like sending out packages? And then you just like hire friends and friends, friends of friends. Um, and then it gets into like, let's hire people who want this as their career path and it can grow into like a bigger role. And then now we're at the point where like, we're hiring people who have like five to 10 years experience in what we need them to do. 
So it's kind of like, for me, it was a progression. And I don't know if that's the right way to look at it. I, it worked for me. I think if I were to start another business, I would skip step one through three and just jump to four. But um, yeah, I saw another hand. No. Yes? No. Yes, Steve. So the Rollins Center is working really hard to try to get more women in. Yes, the women, yes. Yeah, so what we're always doing wrong in Utah, and don't take offense to this, I know you won't, is that they're a white man trying to solve the problem, right? Yes. <laughs> and so if you want to get more women involved, get women involved in trying to solve the problem. Because you guys are great, but it's a different, it's a different bag for women. The thing is, you should take comfort in this. I actually spoke about this on a podcast today. No one in Utah is doing it great. There's this thing called the Parity Pledge that's going around right now. Have you all heard of this? Have you heard of it? It's so dumb. Uh, Domo and Pluralsight and all these huge companies signed it saying, we'll interview as many women as we will men. It's like, who cares? That's dumb. Um, what needs to happen is there needs to be a seat at the table for a woman. And uh, Scott Peterson, to his credit, do you all know Scott? Yeah. Um, I actually quit working with BYU because I worked with BYU for two years and it was not the best of experiences. And I felt like, hey, I want to help. I want to help students. I want to help future female leaders. I want to be able. I want them to have access to me. And you know who had access to me? Guys who were starting baby brands. Which that's awesome, but I don't have much to give other than here are some contacts in the baby industry. Like. I am a woman. There are different challenges for women that are starting a business. There are different, it's just different. And I want to be able to be accessible to women. And I didn't feel like that was happening. So I said, okay, I quit. Um, and then Scott Peterson this summer spent about eight man hours talking to me on the phone, getting me back involved. And then also he put me on the board. He put his money where his mouth was and he put me on the board. And so I feel like there's going to be Hopefully, we can start to be a better place and be more welcoming to women. And if any of you girls want to reach out to me, it's just susan at freshlypicked.com. Email me. I will answer your email. I'll take you out to lunch. Um, you guys, too, but I'll answer the girls' emails first. But um, I think it just, it just starts with awareness, and it starts with having women help solve the problem. So yeah. Yes, you should. Yeah. Like here, but here's, here's for all of you. If you feel like something needs to exist, I call, I call them my morning thoughts. You guys, it's not, but like, you know when you wake up in the morning and you turn over and you're like, there's that thought there and you're like, Ugh, I told you to go away. Why are you still here? I thought you were gone. I thought we decided we're not going to do this. If that's happening to you and there's something that you feel like you need to do, you better freaking do it. That's, there's a reason that keeps coming back. Jesus is telling you guys something. So you got to do it. Yes. How many people work in the person? 96. That includes uh, all of our manufacturing employees, too. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned Davis Smith and Cotopaxi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So on an annual basis, Freshly Pick donates about two to five percent of our product to to like uh, we we use this organization in California that we donate through, and it goes to underprivileged moms and babies. And um, cause marketing actually makes me super uncomfortable. From like, I, and I. I don't care what anyone else does, it's just like me and how I run my business. But I hate the thought of like, if you don't buy, then this poor person who actually needs something, we're not, like, we're not gonna give it to them. And so I've never, it comes up all the time. Every time we have a new employee, they're like, what about a give back? And I'm like, no, I don't like it. Um, so I've, I've actively resisted that because I don't think it's part of our core message and I don't think, I think if you're gonna give, just give. 
for me, this is me giving myself advice. I love Davis and I love what he's doing and I totally believe in Cotopaxi and their whole message and the whole brand. But for Freshly Picked and for Susan Peterson, I, if I'm gonna give, I'm just gonna give. And I'm never gonna call attention to it. Uh, bye Bye Baby one, or not Bye Bye Baby. Um, what's it called? The place we donate to in LA, they wanna do this whole press release and I was like, no. Like just, can we please just give? And then like, please don't talk about it to anyone. We just wanna be able to give. Any other questions? Come on. Yes. that at the end of the day, like, I don't matter. <laughs> I know that feels like, like, it's, it's that, that I just actually have to do the work and then like let it, that this is mine to mess up, kind of. Does that make sense? Or no? No. Like, I have been given like this huge gift and like, by all accounts, like, I shouldn't be here. Like, I didn't go to college. I grew up super poor with no mentorship or no one to look up to who's done this before. I just created something out of nothing. And I don't know why, or I don't know how, like I do know, like I can see the numbers and we could sit down, I could model something out for you. But this is, this is a huge gift. And all of you guys that are here, this is a huge gift. Like the fact that you're at BYU in the business program, like this is a huge, gift and it's also yours to mess up. And so the biggest thing you can do is just be grateful for it. And so gratitude, you know, that's a big one for me. Um, humility, realizing that I'm like, I don't know, I didn't do anything to deserve this. And it just happened and so I'm just gonna try to ride the wave till it crashes and then start something new, you know? One more, yes. When you started uh, selling beef products for profit, did you ever, uh, what kind of products did you start? Because I imagine the baby moccasins weren't the first. Or were they? Yeah, so I did only baby moccasins until we had 10 million in sales. So we had one product category. Yeah. And we just started diversifying this year. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any books? Yeah, so first Nephi, second Nephi. <laughs> Jerem, Omni, <laughs> Words of Mormon, Amoziah. <laughs> I forgot. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>